Let's take a look at the investigational multiple sclerosis drug Vitaflutamus calcium, purported to be a one-two punch, having both anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective effects. Currently in phase three trials, we'll take a look at the results of phase two trials and see how effective it is in both relapsing and progressive MS, along with the potential side effects. Vitaflutamus calcium is a simple small molecule depicted in the upper right, being developed by the small pharmaceutical company Immunic. It may have two distinct mechanisms of action. One is to inhibit the enzyme dihydroorotate dehydrogenase, or DHODH, similar to the mechanism of action of the MS drug Abajo. And this drug would be taken as a once daily pill. Abajo is believed to be a modestly effective medication for MS. However, it has a relatively low risk of serious infections. It's possible Vita Flutamus may have less off-target effects, in other words, more specificity for the target protein, and could potentially have a lower risk of liver injury, though that is unproven. What's interesting about this drug is it may actually have a second important biological effect, which is to activate nuclear receptor-related 1, or NUR1, which may have some neuroprotective effects, and this drug is in development for both MS and ulcerative colitis. The phase 2 trials in both relapsing and progressive MS are completed, and there are two ongoing phase three trials in relapsing MS called Ensure One and Ensure Two. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. So Vita Flutamus blocks the enzyme DHODH involved in pyrimidine synthesis as shown in this pathway. Pyrimidines are nucleotides, components of DNA, cytosine, and thymine. And this salvage pathway specifically is important in rapidly dividing cells, such as the lymphocytes, active B and T cells involved in inflammation in MS, but also other rapidly dividing cells, such as in the gastrointestinal tract, which is why you can get loose stools as a side effect with abagio and Vita Flutamus, and also the hair follicles, which is why you can potentially get hair loss with this class of drugs. However, it turns out there's also a separate de novo pathway. So this salvage pathway is very important in rapidly dividing cells, but resting lymphocytes like memory B and T cells can use the de novo pathway, in other words, synthesizing pyrimidines from raw components, and so it's not as toxic to those cells and doesn't have that profound of an effect on the immune system. And in fact, a Abajo is not associated with a significant increased risk of infections. The other potential mechanism of action is to activate NUR1, which is also known as NR4A2, and this has important neuroprotective effects. It may allow neurons to survive in certain toxic environments. It also alters gene expression and may reduce the expression of pro-inflammatory genes in microglia. These are cells of the innate immune system them which may be involved in smoldering multiple sclerosis and progression independent of relapse activity in both relapsing and progressive MS. In animal studies, it's been found that mice deficient in NUR1 have decreased production of the neurotransmitter dopamine and have symptoms of Parkinsonism, in other words, a movement disorder typical of Parkinson's disease. There are also rare genetic variants of NR4A2 in humans, and this can cause developmental disorders disabilities and Parkinsonism. And here's a timeline of studies suggesting that less activity of NUR1 is linked to MS. For instance, this 2014 study suggesting that downregulation of NUR1 and CD4 positive, in other words, helper T cells, is linked to relapsing MS. In this autopsy study of 46 humans with MS, higher expression of NUR1 in the motor cortex was linked to greater density of neurons and lower or inflammation driven by lymphocytes, though this is a bit dubious, it could easily be reverse causation with more destruction of tissue, you might get reduced expression of many proteins. And by the way, there are other existing drugs that stimulate NUR1, including the malaria drugs amodiaquin and chloroquine, the second one you may have heard of due to the research in COVID-19, and the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug glafenine in the same class of medications as ibuprofen. So let's take a look at the clinical trials, and we'll start with the Emphasis Phase 2 trial in relapsing remitting MS. 
There were 268 participants age 18 to 55, and this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, and they compared three doses of vetoflutamus, 10 milligrams, 30 milligrams, or 45 milligrams once a day versus placebo, and they added the 10 milligram dose later as an amended protocol. The study was done in Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, and Ukraine, and it was a short study, only 24 weeks. Here are the results results in terms of active new gadolinium enhancing lesions that take up the contrast dye due to breakdown of the blood brain barrier. You can see the 10 milligram dose was ineffective at stopping these lesions with the same rate compared to placebo, but the 30 milligram dose reduced lesions that were active by 76% and the 45 milligram dose reduced them by 41%. In terms of relapses or clinical MS attacks, there were no statistically significant differences between between placebo and the three doses of vetoflutamus, though there were few relapses in the trial overall, and it was a short trial. For the placebo group, the annualized relapse rate or relapse rate per person per year was 0.52. For 10 milligram vetoflutamus, it was 0.28. For 30 milligrams, it was 0.38. And for 45 milligrams, it was 0.47. They measured changes in disability with the EDSS scale. This is expanded disability status scale. It's a 0 to 10 disability scale used in MS research, and there were no statistically significant differences, although essentially most people were stable in this short trial. They looked at changes in EDSS, and for placebo it was plus 0.07, so they got worse, but only a little bit worse on average. For the 10 milligram group, they got worse by 0.06, and for the 30 milligram and 45 milligram group, they were essentially stable 0.01 and 0 0.00 change in EDSS. This is confirmed disability worsening. These are people who worsened on the EDSS and then when they were evaluated later on, they still were worse, so it was confirmed. It wasn't just day-to-day -day fluctuation or temporary worsening with a relapse. And again, there were no statistically significant differences. 4% were worse with placebo versus 2, 1, and 1% with the three doses of vetoflutamus, though it's hard to demonstrate differences in disability because many people with relapsing MS are stable over a six-month period anyway. They looked at neurofilament light chain, a biomarker in MS. This is a breakdown product of the central nervous system and correlates with CNS injury. It's associated with MS relapses and is weakly correlated with progressive disability in MS. They looked at a comparison to the placebo group of the three different doses of vetoflutamus, and you can see the 10 milligram dose was was ineffective at reducing neurofilament light chain. The confidence intervals interact with zero. However, the 30 milligram dose did reduce neurofilament by a statistically significant amount, and the 45 milligram dose was perhaps a little bit more effective. So overall, the 10 milligram dose didn't perform well, and the 30 milligram and 45 milligram doses were perhaps about equal. In the Insure 1 and 2 Phase 3 ongoing trials, they chose the doses 15 milligrams and 30 milligrams to study. I'm not sure the 15 milligram dose makes sense since the 10 milligram dose didn't look good. Seems like a waste of time in my opinion. In terms of the side effects, the overall rate of reported events with vetoflutamus was pretty similar to placebo. There were rare serious adverse events. All were in the 30 milligram group. One person had squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. One person had a bone fracture and someone else had a kidney stone and nephritis, in other words, a kidney infection. But the investigators thought these could all be unrelated to vetoflutamus. There were three people who stopped vetoflutamus, all in the 45 milligram dose, two for elevated liver enzymes and one with rash, and the liver abnormalities resolved spontaneously after stopping the offending agent. So this may be why they wanted to avoid the 45 milligram dose in the phase three trials. There were no deaths reported in this study. So now let's move to the Caliper trial, which studied progressive MS. So they looked at both secondary and primary progressive MS, and there were 420 participants, 268 with SPMS and 152 with PPMS. And it was a 120-week or slightly more than two-year study with an eight-year 
their open label extension phase afterwards, which is ongoing. So we'll get some really good safety data from this extension trial eventually. They chose the higher dose, vetoflutamus calcium, 45 milligrams once daily versus placebo, age up to 65, which is very important. Many people with progressive MS are older than 55, and there were 70 sites in North America and Europe. And on the EDSS disability scale, you could have an EDSS up to 6.5, meaning a walker or bilateral support, such as two crutches, was needed to walk. So you could have a little bit more disability, which is great because we need to study medications in people with older age and more advanced disability because people in this category tend to have less options right now. And they wanted to look at people with less inflammation to really prove this drug works in real progressive MS. So you had to have no relapse in the last 24 months. And of course, prior disability progression, or else maybe you don't really have progressive MS. And the primary outcome was whole brain atrophy. Here are the characteristics of people in the trial. The median age was 51, 64.7% were women. Unfortunately, 98.7% were white, so we don't have any data really on ethnic minorities. The median body mass index was 25. The median SDMT, this is symbol digit modalities test, a measure of cognitive function was 35, which is somewhat low. Average in this age group is probably around 50 to 60. So some people in the study had some degree of cognitive impairment. And the median EDSS was 5.5, which is having the ability to walk short distances without assistances, without a cane. But many participants did have the requirement of a cane or a walker. And the percentage of people in the study who had gadolinium positive or active lesions was 16.3%. In other words, the minority, and that was 6.8% of people with secondary progressive MS and 17.8% in people with primary progressive MS. And notably, this is less than the proportion in the oratorio study, the pivotal trial that led to the approval of Ocrevus for primary progressive MS. So this is sort of a less inflammatory cohort than the oratorio trial. So if this medication worked, it would be very impressive. And it did work a little bit. So those who were randomized to vetoflutamus had 20% less disability progression compared to those who got placebo. In terms of the absolute numbers, 16.2% who got vetoflutamus had confirmed disability progression versus 20.3% who got placebo. So in absolute terms, it was a 4.1% difference, though this is only over a roughly two-year period. Now, in terms of subgroup analysis, if you looked at specifically those with primary progressive MS, it was a little bit more effective, 30% reduction in disability progression, although for reasons beyond the scope of this particular video, my opinion is that PPMS and SPMS are the same disease. I personally wouldn't make a distinction. Now, you may say maybe the efficacy of the drug was driven by that inflammatory activity, those gadolinium enhancing lesions. But looking at specifically people who did not have active lesions, there was a 29% reduced disability progression in those that did not have active lesions. So that's a good sign that maybe there really is something non-inflammatory going on with that NER1 receptor. Now, this is not a published trial. I don't have all the data, so I don't have the serum neurofilament light chain data yet, but they did release a midpoint analysis during the trial, and at that point, there was a 22% reduction in neurofilament light chain in those who got beta-flutamus compared to placebo. Let's move to the MRI outcomes. So the primary outcome of the study, reduction in brain atrophy or brain shrinkage was negative. There was only 5% less atrophy in those who got beta-flutamus, and it was not statistically significant. So you could say this was a negative trial, although reducing Reducing disability progression is really more important to people with MS than making the pictures look better. I'll note that in the Hercules trial, the primary progressive MS trial for the drug tolibrutinib, the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor that could get FDA approved later this year, it was also relatively
truly ineffective in reducing brain atrophy, also a roughly 5% effect. Now, they looked at specific areas of the brain, and in terms of reducing thalamic volume loss, it was 20% effective. They also looked at T2 lesion volume, the change from baseline, and those who got vetoflutamus had slight reduction in the lesions, minus 0.22%, whereas those who got placebo had a gain in lesions by roughly 3%. So it seems to have some effect on MRI. In terms of the side effects, the overall rate of adverse events was roughly the same with vetoflutamus and placebo. For serious adverse events, it was a little bit more 8.1% percent compared to 6.5 percent with placebo. Some reported events include pyelonephritis or kidney infection. Although there was one case with treatment and one case with placebo, there were two people who got vertigo and none with placebo, which wouldn't be an expected side effect. And no people had significant liver injury. I don't have the data on the liver function test if there were milder elevations of liver function tests. We don't have the full publication and there are a lot of missing p-values on those MRI lesions. If I do get the full publication, I'll post it in the notes below. We could also assume the side effects with a Baggio, the established MS drug, which also affects the DHODH enzyme, could occur with vetoflutamus, such as elevation of liver function tests, loose stools, usually not severe, or nausea, thinning of the hair, though again, usually not severe. You can also get neuropathy with this medicine, not numbness due to central nervous system injury as an MS, but actually separate damage to the peripheral nerves. And infections have been reported, though it doesn't seem to be a significantly increased risk. So the reaction to the press release of the Caliper trial was actually negative. The stock went down by about 23% after that statement. And that's probably because the primary outcome, brain atrophy reduction, was negative, and the overall reduction in disability progression was only 20%. However, my opinion, if they could prove in a phase three trial that this drug reduces disability progression in 60 and 65 year olds with progressive MS, even by 20 to 30%, if there's a low rate of side effects, that still does have value, just my personal opinion. And I'm not convinced that the NER1 receptor has anything to do with this. When people have done genome-wide association studies, there's actually no association of gene variants of NER1 one and MS. All the risk genes of MS really have to do with the immune system. So this could be a red herring, though it's certainly interesting. And I'd love to see a phase three trial. This company in Munich is looking for some funding and hopefully we'll be able to follow this along. I'd like to know what you think if there was a phase three trial in progressive MS, would you participate if you weren't doing well with other options on the market? And as usual, let me know if you have ideas for other videos.